Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 this morning. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. Let me give you the outline if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us. Number one, it was received by grace. It was received by grace. Paul received it personally by grace, and the church received Paul's letter by grace. And that's important because you have to remember, Paul had not actually been in Rome at this point. Uh, he was only going by other Christians who had been there. And uh, we will talk about that here in just a minute. Number two, it was centered in the gospel. It was centered in the gospel. Folks, all ministry, all ministry should be centered in the gospel. If we are not sharing the gospel, we are not doing what God has asked us to do. It doesn't matter what ministry it is. You can just tag any of the ministries that we have uh, in our church. And somewhere along the way, we need to center it in the gospel. Number three, and this is very important, folks, it is done by the Holy Spirit. People ask me all the time, what is going on at Rye Hill Baptist Church? And my simple explanation is the Holy Spirit is there. It's the Holy Spirit. It is God. It is not Steve and I. It isn't. We are mere man. Paul was a mortal. Paul was a, a mere man. I know he did a lot of uh, mighty things, but I'm telling you, uh, he had his issues and Steve and I have ours also. Uh, just talk to our wives if you want to see about that. So, you know, uh, every chapter of the book of Romans is about the doctrine of salvation. In our text today, Paul begins to write the epilogue to this amazing book. He first begins with the defense of his ministry. Then, uh, Paul then encourages the believers in Rome to be bold in their faith and in witnessing uh, to their lost family members and friends. One of the key words found in these closing chapters is ministry. Folks, we, the church, should be involved in ministry. Everyone under the sound of my voice, whether you're here or whether you are online, if you are saved, you should be in some type of ministry. And the simple definition of ministry, two words, servanthood or serving. What did Jesus come? He came to seek and save the lost. But what did he do all the time? He was serving other people. There was a shock on the face of the disciples when he was washing their feet. Folks, that's what service is. Paul's point in his writings is that we all have a ministry that we need to be a part of. Paul shares his ministry with the Christians in Rome as a testimony and witness of God's call on his life. May we all understand the purpose and plan God has for our personal lives and our personal walk with Christ. May we also carry out God's plan in our everyday lives. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. Romans 15 verse 14, Now I myself, and confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. There is a lot said here in this first verse, which is 14. He is confident in the Christians there. Because, you know, when we look at the last two weeks, he kept talking about the strong Christians and the weak Christians. And he was chiding some of, of them both. The weak, the weak folks need to keep growing in the Lord, and the strong ones need to cut them some slack. And so here, it's almost like there is a change in Paul's writing here. Paul kind of just, you know, calms down, and he assures, and he is telling the church there that he has confidence in their relationship with Christ. And he calls them, my brethren. Okay, even though he had not been there, he knew there were Christians and there was a strong Christian leadership in the Roman church. And you have to understand how important that is, folks. The Ro you know, when you look at Rome, you, you know, you just look at one word and it, you would use the word worldly. Okay, 
Uh, I think in our day and time, when I hear the word Las Vegas, all right, I think, you know, and, and it's been tagged this, the city of sin. And if there ever was a place that needed a strong church, it was in Rome. So he is telling them, you are doing well. You are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. That's talking about uh, they were in love with the Word of God. Folks, every Christian should be in love with the Word of God. We shouldn't have to make ourselves read the Bible. It ought to it ought to happen every day of our lives. And I even go as far to say is you need to start the day in the Word and you need to end the day in the Word. I have two devotions that I go through every day, every day of my life. And I'm telling you, you need to start the day because of what's ahead of you and you need to end the day because what's inside of you. You've been in the world, okay, influenced by computers and, and, you know, Facebook and all these things. And we the last thing we need to think of is the Word of God. And also able to admonish one another. They were full of goodness, knowledge, and admonishing is encouraging one another. The Bible says in, in verse 15, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as a reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. And he's almost apologizing there. He said, I, I know I've been hard on you. I know some of the word of God. And, and folks, the word is God is truth. It is amen. All right? It's not something that we should uh, water down. It's not something that we should change to live our lifestyles. Our lifestyles need to change and line up with the Word of God. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I know I've said some hard things through here, but you guys are doing good. I have heard of your testimonies. And you understand the grace that God gives us. I hope you understand you have been given the grace of God in your life if you are saved. He saved me in spite of myself. He saved me in spite of the times that I had said no to Christ, and he was wanting me to be saved. He was saved me from grace and, and a false profession that I made when I was 14 years old. And so Paul is telling them, nevertheless, he said, I have written to you more boldly on some points because of the grace given to me by God. And if there was every someone who lived under grace, it was the Apostle Paul. Hold your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians 15 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. This is Paul's personal testimony. For I am the least of the apostles. What was he doing? Number one, he was being humble, okay? And he truly believed what he said. I and Paul, I'm just telling you, I can relate to Paul. I know I acted more like Peter, all right? But I can relate to Paul. I am one of the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle. And then he tells you why. Because I persecuted the church of Christ, the church uh, of God, excuse me. And then what he is saying is, when I was Saul, I rounded up Christians. I intimidated them. I threatened them. I threw them in jail, and I even had allowed people to die. And you think of Stephen in Acts and what happened to Stephen. If you remember, the, his, his, you know, uh, Paul, Saul was there, and he okayed that execution. And I believe in my heart of hearts, because of his past, because of what he had done, he ran the race. I'm talking full throttle for Jesus Christ. Nothing stopped him. Nothing scared him. Nothing intimidated him. He lived for God because of the grace of God in our lives. I hope you understand none of us deserve heaven. You can't give God your spiritual resume and say, look at what I've done. I deserve heaven. 
to go to heaven. Folks, we don't deserve that. Because of our sin in our lives, the Bible says we are all guilty. We are guilty. And Paul here is expressing that in his own life. But, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Three times he speaks of the grace of God here. The importance of the grace of God in your life. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace towards me was not in vain. God interrupted Saul's life on the way to Damascus. God had to blind him by a light for three full days. God had to get his attention and saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And folks, we were all lost before we were saved. We were all bound for hell. And it was God's grace that allowed us to be saved. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and you so believed. Paul was telling the church at Corinth, listen, when I got saved, my life totally changed. The Holy Spirit turned things around for me. And now God is using me. And folks, I truly believe he was one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived because they did not have computers back then. You walked where you went. If you had a horse, you were fortunate. You rode ships when you crossed bodies of water. And the communication was very, very slow back then. Yet you'll see later on, he covered a lot of ground. And so, God, so Paul knew God's grace in his life. And I pray today that you understand God's grace in your life. He woke you up today. You ought to say thank you. He gives you health. You ought to say thank you. He puts food on your table, and if you were out of electricity, we were only out 15 hours of electricity on Tuesday night, and some were out much longer than that. And you know what it made? It made me appreciate electricity. Lori slept in a hoodie, all right? And I had three blankets on me. But let me tell you, that is nothing compared to what Paul went through. Paul knew God's grace. Colossians 3. Colossians 3, and he's, he's talking about, uh, you know, the church there in Rome and I believe this scripture really applies to them. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I'm telling you, you want to get close to Christ, you get close to his word. You want to be wise, you want wisdom in your life, you get close to his word. You not just read the word, you study the word. You don't only just study the Word, you live the Word. That Word comes alive in you, and you live out that Word. And that's what he was saying to the church in Romans. As he was ending this book, he was saying, man, y'all love the Word. And that's why Mike Taylor comes here, and Mike Taylor has said this to me more than once. Hey, Rye Hill Baptist Church loves the Word. Folks, we need the Word. We should desire the Word. We should apply the Word in our life. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you in all, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Where are psalms found? In the Old Testament. Folks, there are some people that believe you could just throw away the Old Testament if you want. Folks, you're throwing away wisdom. We need to read all of the Old Testament we need to read all of the New Testament. We need to make these psalms, these quotes, these songs part of our lives. I would got a gift certificate to one of the Christian bookstores, and I went there Friday, and, you know, there's all these albums there. And I bet I took 30 minutes, Steve, to pick out two, out, two CDs that I wanted because there's so much out there. And basically what uh, I, I got, I got one hymns of praise and one worship songs. 
And now when I get in my truck, pop it in, and man, I'm telling you, I'm worshiping wherever I'm going. Folks, we need to be in an attitude of worship everywhere we go. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. He's talking about our Christian witness. It doesn't matter what we say or our actions. They need to be Christ-like in everything. And that's what he is telling this church. Man, you are on the right track. But keep believing, keep reading, keep growing, keep loving, keep serving one another. That's what he is telling the church at Rome. So we can see it was received by grace. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles was received by grace. Number two, it was centered in the gospel. In the gospel. Folks, that's who we are. The gospel is everything to us. Look at verse 16. That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ. And again, I understand I am employed by Rahil Baptist Church. But folks, even before I got into the ministry, I was a minister of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ. And we are all ministers of Jesus Christ if you are saved. And he tells them, to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And you will notice the Trinity in Paul's writing here. He said in verse 15, grace was given to me by God, God the Father who created everything. And he said, I will be a minister of Jesus Christ. That is the second person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we may offer the offering to the Gentiles acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Folks, all three of these persons have a function in your life. It is God that created you. It is God who looks over you. It is Jesus Christ that you emulate. It is Jesus Christ. And if you want something, if you desire something, I'm telling you, ask God for the mind of Christ. Lord, I need the mind of Christ in my life. And then there's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is is that function of speaking to you. In the Holy Spirit, I have never heard God in an audible voice. But there is not a day in my life that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to me. God speaks to us. Through the Holy Spirit. Now, notice what Paul says uh, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. And what is he saying? He is saying the Gentiles, the church at Rome, is that sacrifice in my ministry, that the, the Word of God, the book of Romans, ministered to them. And Paul hadn't been there yet, but if he sends that letter, it would be as if he had been there. What does Romans 12 tell us? That we should be living sacrifices. Living. Folks, anybody can die for Christ. Anybody can die for Christ. But he wants you to live for him. Every day of your life, every day of your life, filled by the Holy Spirit, filled with the love of God, filled with ministry. You have a ministry. Every one of us have people around us that watch us every day of our lives. Listen to me, young people. You have a ministry at school. They watch what you say. They watch what you do. And you are teaching them. You are showing them something. And it's a ministry. Look at verse 17. Therefore I have reason to glory in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. And Paul is just trying to remind them that, listen, it's, it's not about me. I mean, he wrote a third of the New Testament. His walk was incredible. But yet he is saying the most important person is Jesus Christ. The most important thing that we do in the ministry is share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he is saying. Acts chapter 9. Look at Acts 9. Acts 9 verse 20. And I will say, Paul was the exception to the rule. Very few people this happens to, 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 but I'm telling you, it does happen in modern times. 
he again went to Ananias. He, Ananias, laid hands on him. The blinders came off, and, and he was ready to go. Look at verse 20. Immediately, he preached the Christ. Folks, when you get something, you want to tell somebody about it. When something changes your life, you want to tell somebody about it. When you're excited about something, you want to tell somebody about it. Immediately, he preached Christ in the synagogues. Why? Because he was a Jew. Because he knew every bit of the law. He started at home. And he is the son, that he is the son of God. And folks, that is the gospel. Jesus is in the center of everything we believe. It's our doctrine. It's who we are. Look at verse 21. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name uh, in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? What were people immediately saying? Oh, he's trying to fool y'all. He's setting a trap, man. Don't fall for that. If you say you're a Christian, man, you're going to jail. But yet, Paul kept doing it in spite of of persecution. Paul didn't give up. He didn't throw in the towel. All right, he stayed in the fight. Look at verse 22. But Paul increased in all the more in strength and confounded. Notice the word. First amazed them and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Oh, folks, uh, you know, we just need to be full of Jesus. Matter of fact, uh, I like, and I don't know who said it, but I want to be so full of Jesus, if a mosquito bit me, it would go humming. Uh, there's power in the blood when he leaves uh, my, my place. All right? If somebody squeezes me, man, Jesus is coming out. Not curse words. That's what he's saying, folks. Paul started running folks he ran the race and then in Ephesians chapter 3 look at Ephesians 3 if you would Ephesians 3 the Bible says in verse 8 to me who I am less than the least of all saints okay first he says I'm the least of the apostles now he says I'm the least of all the Christians all the saints of God this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus. What's he, what is he talking about? He said that mystery is the Old Testament. You think about how hard it was to accept Christ if you were Abraham, okay? And I know he's the father of all nations, but I'm telling you, folks, Christ had not uh, been, been born yet. The New Testament had not been written yet. And you look at the Old Testament sometimes, and it, it was almost like a mystery to people in those days. Their faith had to be so strong that they believed in a coming Messiah in the prophetic scriptures that we read. Verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. What did God do? What do we have in front of us? We have God's holy word. We have God's holy word. Folks, nobody can truly have an excuse not to witness. Why? Because we have a textbook. We have classes. Scott, after the new members class, is going to teach a witnessing class. We do that so that you can take the Word of God and share the Word of God with people around you. You have a ministry. That ministry is important. And that's what Paul is saying. This manifold wisdom, the wisdom of God, can be found in the Word of God. And people are living in darkness. Oh, folks, it's so dark right now. Our world is so dark. They need Jesus Christ. And it says, uh, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
What is God's eternal purpose? What would God love to happen? He would love everyone to be saved. Now I understand that not everyone's going to be saved. That's a truth in Scripture. But folks, we don't know who the elect are and who, or who's not. So our goal, our job, is to share the gospel with everyone we come in contact with. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and excess with confidence through faith in Him. Folks, when you're witness, it's not about you. When I was in Evangelical Explosion, it was a 17-week course. And I, honestly, I had to learn it on a weekend, not 17 weeks. I went to a class, and I thought, man, I'm going to flunk a Bible class. Because there was so much memorizing, all this going on. And by the way, I did pass it, all right? But I'm simply saying, folks, it's not something that you just memorize. The Word of God, you put in your heart. You have the Word of God. That's, that's what I love, Scott, about this way. You have the Word of God in front of you. You can't mess it up. Because the Holy Spirit will take over if you will just get it started. Therefore, verse 13, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And let me tell you, folks, the Bible tells us all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You're going to have a kickback, but folks, at least you're not going to probably die for the cause of Christ. Somebody may talk about you. Hey, if they're talking about you, they're leaving somebody else alone. Folks, I'm just telling you, we have the mystery, and it's been opened. The Word of God is open. We have free will. Is open. Anyone can preach. I can go down Garrison Avenue and get on a street corner and preach, and as long as I don't incite a riot, I can preach there all day long. And folks, we have the gospel of Christ, and that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying it is centered in the gospel, but if we don't share it, people won't be saved. So we see it was received by grace. It was centered in the gospel. And the last thing, it was done by the Holy Spirit. That's what I love about Paul. Man, Paul just depended on the Holy Spirit. He just totally depended on the Holy Spirit. Uh, look at verse uh, 18. For I will not dare speak to any of those things which Christ has, has not accomplished through me in word or deed to make the Gentiles obedient. He's saying, man, it's not me. You know, I don't want you to glory in me. You're not following me. You're following Christ. Okay? I'm only speaking for Christ. Verse 19, in mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Elytrium, uh, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And when you think about that, folks, everywhere Paul went, he started a church. Everywhere he went, there were many churches. And what he was saying here, <coughs> excuse me, and what he'll say, if you look on down to verse 20, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. What did he do? He started new churches in every city that he went. He wasn't depending on someone else to go in and to the, do that for him. Folks, I believe with all my heart, he was the greatest church planner that ever lived. With what he did, with what he had to do and the transportation and the communication and all of that. And he would stay there sometimes six months, sometimes a year, sometimes even two years. And he would find leadership in those new churches and in those new converts. And he would not leave till he knew that congregation was in good shape. And that's what he's saying. Even with the signs and wonders, because you think about that, and, and, and Paul saw himself, you know, I mean, if you get the Jewish thing and you look at the Old Testament as a priest, and the Bible even tells us we are all priests. Okay? We are, we are priests. The New Testament tells us that. We are in service 
for our Lord and our Savior. And what Paul is saying here, he is saying the signs and wonders are still happening. You think about Paul. What happened when him and Silas in the Philippian jail? I mean, they were singing praises to God and praying to God and Man, jail break. I mean, the, the jail broke open and he got out. Because I'm telling you, if he just stayed in there, he would have lost his life. And God said, no, not yet. Not yet. What else happened? Some sorcerer, some witchcraft was going on. And Paul rebuked him and he went blind. What about a young teenager that died? And Paul went in and laid hands on him and he came back to life. You saying, Brother Mike? Are you saying we can do that? I'm saying you can't do. I, as you, folks, let me put it this way. It is God that does the healing. Okay, God does the healing. But I've got something better than healing. And you know what that is? That is salvation. We have something. Because even if you get healed, you're going to die anyway, sometime. And I'm all for healing. I'm all for James chapter Three, or chapter 5, I'm all for laying on hands. I've anointed bodies with oil. But it's not me, folks. It's God. God does the healing. And folks, what he was saying was the greatest thing that we can give a person is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because when they get saved, they are healed forever. Forever. Their name is written in the Lamb's book of life we are ministers we are all ministers of God of the gospel and we can share the gospel as Paul shared the gospel and look at this last part of that verse and and he the, the deal about the Jerusalem and his travels he traveled over 1400 miles in his mission trips 1400 miles either walking or on an animal or on a ship. Okay? And really, folks, I don't think God's asking us to go 1,400 miles. We can go. But sometimes we don't even go across the street. We don't even get to know our neighbors. We are intimidated at work. And I understand you can't do it while you're working, but there's breaks and there's afterwards and there's beforehand, there's lunch breaks. There's all kinds of times that we can share the gospel with others. Look what it says. To whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard, they shall understand. He's quoting Isaiah 52, 15, and it is speaking of a coming Messiah. Verse Mark chapter 16, verse 19 and 20. Mark 16, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 20, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the company of signs. And again, folks, you shouldn't look for signs and you shouldn't look for wonders. But I'm telling you, when God answers a prayer, that is a sign. When God saves people, that is a miracle. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in the craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Even Paul later on said, man, my hands are clean. I've shared the gospel with everything, everybody that I could possibly share the gospel with, who minds are the God of this age and are blinded. And folks, people are blinded by Satan. Man, Satan's got them believing they got time. Satan's believing that they can live any way they want. Satan is the God of this world. And when I say God, I'm talking little g. For we do not preach ourselves, verse 5, but Christ Jesus, ourselves, the bondservants, there's that word, for Jesus' sake, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts and give light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Folks, only God 
can take someone who has an addiction. I'm talking something that has gripped their life and they've never been able to overcome and make them a saint. Only God can do that, folks. And that is the gospel. Then Acts 1.8, I know you know this, but we need to say it because this is our mission. Acts 1.8, and I'm, I'm through. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on, upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Folks, where do we start? I would suggest we start in our neighborhood. I suggest we start in our workplaces. I suggest that we start in our families. I suggest we start in uh, the people that we run around with and our friends. And then you know what? You know how cool this is. Then you know what God's doing? We don't have to try, travel 2,000 miles across the ocean because unreached people groups have come to us, folks. They have come to us. Sign up and go to Fort Worth. Sign up and go to Cincinnati. Find out what it means to minister to unreached people groups. Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for Paul's life. What an amazing life. And God, I pray that we would understand that we all live under grace. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve a lot of things. But God, you give them to us. We have security of the believer. We can know that when we die, we go to heaven. And God, I pray if there's one here today, one here today that doesn't know you, God, I pray they would come. They would make a profession of faith. A profession means you come to the front. A profession means you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A profession means I want everybody to know through Christ I'm going to change. I'm going to change. And God, I thank you for the promise of your word. I thank you that it is written in your word. So God, I pray that you would just save somebody today, God. Save somebody. And then I pray for all the Christians. They're all ministers. They're all ministers. And God, I pray that we would uh, be of service to others. We would have that servant attitude and we would serve others. And God, I pray that more than anything else, we would be like Jesus. We would want to be like Jesus. And God, when we get an opportunity to share, God, I pray that we would share the gospel of Christ with others. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this time that we've had here. So God, just open up the doors of heaven, God. I pray that people would respond to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? As you stand, would you come?